enjoyed being part of your worship service. Uh, it as well is my favorite hymn, so I don't know who got the memo, but uh, that one's pretty impressive. I love that song and uh, the story behind it. And so, but if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 this evening. Mark chapter 1. And for those of you that don't know much about the book of Mark, the book of Mark was written by a guy named Mark. Okay, so I know that may be really shocking to you. But Mark was a teenager during the life of Christ. So he got to see, you know, Peter and James and John. That's the guy that he was hanging out with as a high schooler. Um, sometimes in scripture you'll read that there was another Mary that was often involved in Jesus' ministry. There's another Mary other than his mother, and that Mary is where they met in her house sometimes, and they did a lot of things. So growing up, John Mark's mom was Mary, not the same Mary that Jesus' Mary was. And um, so John Mark got to grow up with you know guys like Peter and James and John, 12 disciples, coming through his house. I think that would be a pretty neat thing to experience, to have the 12 disciples as regular guests at your home. And that's the way John grew up. And then uh, God uh, moved through John to write, the, or moved through Mark to write the Gospel of Mark. And the Bible tells us, and other historians, that Peter was kind of like a father in the faith to Mark. So as Mark grew up, Peter took John under, or John Mark under his wing. He had two names, John Mark. So when you see him in the book of Acts, he's called John Mark. If you know anything about him, John Mark, you know that um, the Apostle Paul didn't like him. And the Apostle Paul told him to go home. And he couldn't go on a missionary trip because he wasn't cut out for it. But the, later on, Paul says that John Mark grew up and God used him to write this gospel. So this is kind of the, the perspective when we, when we read through the gospel of Mark. This is the person that wrote it. And he got a lot of influence from the Apostle Peter as well. So if you have your Bibles, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I grew up going to church. And when I grew up going to church, we always used to stand we read God's word because we thought it was so, so powerful and we wanted to show it honor. So if you guys would, let's stand as we read God's word this evening. And uh, Mark chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in, the, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, his path is straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and, and wild honey. And he preached, saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I, the scrap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized with water, and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending, descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come and speak with this great church. God, I pray that as we open up your word and as we lift up your Son, that we would be drawn unto him. God, we know that you created each and every one of us individually. So God, you know how to push our buttons. And I pray that tonight the Holy Spirit would do that. That he would, he would change us, that you would help us to see who we are and who we are in the gospel and what you want to do in and through our lives. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now the reason I kind of gave you a little bit of background on Mark is because Mark, he starts his gospel off different than Matthew and Luke. If you've ever read Matthew and Luke, you'll know that they start off with a genealogy. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. And Mark just kind of like skips right to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, they, they, they've said that the book, the Gospel of Mark, is the Gospel in action. The Gospel of Mark records not what Jesus said so much, but more about what Jesus did. So it's the Gospel in action. And so Mark here in the first chapter, he wants to give us a very good introduction. 
Now, I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I wanted to make a good introduction, and sometimes I might have pulled it off, and sometimes I did not pull it off as well. Um, God is allowing my family and I to start a church up in Worthington, um, just on the 23 and 270, and you know God has been blessing. But before we were able to go start our church, uh, we went out and we raised some funds to do that. And as we raised funds, part of my job was basically to go talk to other pastors at other churches and ask them to help us with our funding. And so, you know, I always wanted to make sure when I talked to another pastor, you know, that I really put my best foot forward. I'm kind of a younger guy. You know, a lot of pastors are a little bit older than me, so I really want to, you know, make sure they think that I have my act all together and then I'm, you know, polished and stuff. And, and uh, Dr. Rich, actually, here at the stove, he, uh, he was helping me. And he got me connected with uh, a very large church in Arkansas. And it was one that, you know, it's one of those mega churches that, you know, kind of like six flags over Jesus. I mean, they've got all these huge buildings and everything. And, and so I thought, man, I really want to, you know, put my best foot forward when I give this introduction to this to this church. And so I sat down and I wrote this email out to one of the pastors. And, you know, I wrote that email out and I read it over about 45 times to make sure I didn't have any weird spelling mistakes or grammatical mistakes or said anything that was weird. And so I read through it, I read through it, and I was like, okay, I'm ready to send it. And so I hit send, and I sent it off to this church, and I looked right after I hit send, and in the salutation, um, I'm one of those guys that spell check is my best friend. I don't know if that's you or not. Okay. And so in the spell check, I gave the salutation to the guy, and I said, instead of saying, hello, Doug, I said, Hell, Doug. And so it's a very good way to um, introduce myself to that pastor. But but in this gospel, Mark is being very intentional about how he introduces us to Jesus. Because there's nobody that deserves a better introduction than Jesus Christ. Amen. And John knew it because John not only he got to see Jesus and, and, and walk with Jesus and have all these testimonies. So he knew more than anybody else, more than any of us could ever know, because he actually got to, to walk with Jesus, how important it was to give this great introduction. So we see here right off the bat that Mark identifies who Jesus is. In verse number one, it says, In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Like, he doesn't like, like make you guess who he's talking about here. It's not like one of those movies where, like, the identity of the main character is kind of, like, hidden, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the movie, or at the end of the movie, you find out who they are. Like, Mark was just like, let me tell you from the very, very beginning, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is Christ. He is who we've all been waiting for. Remember, for thousands of years and hundreds of years, there have been prophecies about Jesus. And Mark's like, I have met the guy who you've all been looking for. His name is Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's amazing. Let me tell you all about it. That's what's going on here. And so, so Mark identifies right away. When the Bible says here that he uses the term the gospel of Jesus Christ, it can mean that it is either a book about Jesus or a book for Jesus. And most theologians say that Mark is saying this is a book about Jesus and this is a book for Jesus. And that, so from the very beginning, he starts that. I read this one interesting quote from, from a theologian. He was talking about the gospel, and he said that the gospel is not a discussion, nor is it a debate. It is an announcement. And that's exactly what Mark was doing here. He was making an announcement. He was making an introduction. Now, another thing that we see here is that not only does Mark, he gives that, that, that eyewitness, that testimony. Um, if you've ever been, if you ever used a product and you thought, man, I love this, you've got to try this. Or maybe you, you go to a new restaurant and it's just the best restaurant you've ever eaten at. What do you do? You go tell somebody. You've had that first-hand experience. It's not like when you like pick up the newspaper and see that a new restaurant opened and that some you know fancy guy kind of gave it two stars or five stars. I mean, this is a place that you've been to. You've eaten the food. You know. And so when you go tell somebody, that personal testimony has bearing. And that's what Mark was doing here. Now also it says here that the prophets identified who Jesus was. Now in verse 2 and 3 it says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. 
So Mark here not only says, hey, I know Jesus personally, I've seen him, I've talked with him, I've walked with him, I've been around him. He's like the prophets, Isaiah. And he's also talking about Micah here because he quotes Micah. He said, these prophets that we've been reading for hundreds of years as good Jewish people, they also testify that Jesus is who he says he is. So what does that mean to us? Well, I'm glad you asked. How many of you guys, anybody here ever seen the TV show Pawn Stars? Anybody ever watch that? Okay. I'm a history, you know, buff, and I love the History Channel. And, and on that show, on the History Channel, on Pawn Stars, basically what happens is people come in and they bring stuff, and they say, hey, you know, I want to pawn or sell this. And sometimes they have really cool, interesting, you know, sometimes historical items, and so they'll want a lot of money for it. So the owner of the pawn shop will always say, well, hey, I don't know much about this item, but hey, I've got a buddy. Or I've got a friend, let them come in and they're an expert and let them look at it and look, they can tell us how much this is worth. That's what Mark is doing here. He's calling in the experts. To, to the Jewish people, they knew that the prophets were the experts. They were the ones who were the standard of, they've been saying for so long, this is going to be who comes in. And so when Jesus gets there, Mark is identifying them as, uh, the, with the prophets saying, hey, these guys too say that that they are coming. Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Mal uh, Malachi 3 1 says, Behold, I send a messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come out to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So, what were these prophets talking about? They were saying, hey, there's going to be somebody that's coming. His name is Jesus. He's going to be the Savior. And before he comes, there's just going to be this character. And he goes by the name of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, if we if you were just following along here, the guy liked to hang out in the wilderness. Okay, So if you like to hang out in the wilderness, that's a little bit different. You know, like Survivor Man, you know, he's out in the wilderness doing his thing. The Bible says that he wears camel hair and he has a large leather belt. It goes around. So, I mean, just picture this guy in your mind. I picture this big, burly guy wearing this big camel hair, something or other, with a big leather belt running around the middle of it, big beard, and the Bible says that he liked locusts and honey. Now, that wasn't normal, okay? Something like, well, back in the Bible times, that's what they were eating. That was weird then, just like it's weird now for people to eat locusts and honey. And so, like, you, like way before Duck Dynasty ever came out, like John the Baptist existed. Okay, he was, you know, the bearded wanderer in the wilderness long before the Robertson clan was. And in verses four through eight, it says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair and wore leather belts around his waist and ate locusts and honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of the sandal. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I am baptized with water, and he will baptize with water and the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist knew that he wasn't Jesus, but he knew that he was preparing the way for Jesus to come. A few years ago, my dad was on a flight, and we were missionaries to Germany, so my dad obviously traveled over to Europe quite a bit. And uh, Bill Clinton was president at the time, and when he was on the flight, he was sitting next to someone on Bill Clinton's staff. And he began to talk with them, and, and he said, you know, what are you doing? He said, well, uh, President Clinton is going to be, I think it was London at the time, he's going to be coming over to London, and I've been sent ahead of him to make sure all the preparations are good. Because when the President of the United States shows up to London, you know, he doesn't go on Southwest and book a getaway trip. And you know, I mean, he's, there's a lot of stuff that goes along with this. And so they send teams of people over to make sure his hotel is ready. And then they send a security team over and make sure the security is ready. And you know what? This was a custom that they did back in Bible times. When a king was going to travel to a foreign land, he would send people in front of them. And they would prepare the way of the Lord. And that's what John the Baptist is doing. He's out in the wilderness going, hey guys, I am this crazy guy that's living out in the wilderness baptizing people, but I want you to know that's not my end game. My end game is to tell you that there's somebody that's coming. His name is Jesus, and he's going to be so much better than I ever could be. 
And he's getting people to see that. He's preparing the way. So once again, here is John the Baptist introducing us to who Jesus is going to be. It says here that he warned people in the bare, in the bare wilderness. He was reminiscent of the one that the, that the Israelites' fathers, they wanted around him. People are in need of a solution to the problem of their sin. And John the Baptist knew that. If you are familiar with, the, with history in the Bible, there was the, the, the exodus from Egypt. And the children of Israel began to wander in the wilderness for four years. Well, the Bible likes to teach us by doing things over and over again because I don't know about you, but sometimes I have to learn things over and over again before I actually learn them. And God knew that about us, and so he was teaching us again using the same type of story about remember when the children of Israel were wandering around the wilderness and they needed somebody to come lead them? Now, we know that Moses was leading them in the wilderness. Does anybody know who led them out of the wilderness? Does anybody know the name of that person? Joshua. Joshua, very good. And Joshua, he led them out of that wilderness. Well, do you know what the Greek, Joshua is Hebrew, guess what the Greek name for Joshua is? Jesus. All right, so Joshua and Jesus are the same name, one's Greek and one's Hebrew. And so John the Baptist, you know, he's the one that's crying out, saying, someone's going to lead us out of this wilderness. The wilderness is the fiction of sin. I don't know about you, but when I am sinning and when I go away from God, it fills up the wilderness. It's not a pleasant place to me. It hurts. It's not fun when you are, are away from God. And I think that's the way God designed us to be. Designed us to not want to be in the wilderness, but to seek a way out. And it doesn't matter. All of us have stories, and all of us are sinners. It doesn't matter what we've done. God already knows that. And He knows that that sin was bad, and it's not fun. And, you know, we all can have... We all know our stories of, man, I was just, I was so far away from God, and I needed to be led out of that wilderness, back to God. That's what John the Baptist is saying here. Everybody that's been, that you just feel like your sin has messed your life up, yes, that's normal. Well, let me tell you, Jesus is the one that's going to lead us out of this wilderness into a better place. Also, not only do we see that John the Baptist identifies who Jesus is, we see here that God and the Holy Spirit, they get in on it. They actually come and they identify who Jesus is. The last couple of verses here in Scripture in the past study, right? It says, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, which Nazareth of Galilee, that's a way of saying Jesus came from the middle of nowhere. Okay? Like my mom and dad are from Franklin, Furnace, Ohio. Okay? No one's ever heard of that. That's kind of like where Jesus was from, a place that no one had ever heard of. And he came out of. Um, the Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up on the water, immediately he saw the heavens being opened, torn open, and the Spirit descending like, uh, descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, "You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." Now we read over that, and we might forget that's a pretty cool thing that just happened in Scripture. Jesus goes out to the Jordan, and Jesus is going to be baptized by John the Baptist. And we know from the other gospels, like John Adams, like, Jesus, I, I'm, not, I'm not even worthy to do this. And Jesus, like, it's okay, John, you can do this. And he's like, I don't know, Jesus, like, if I can do this. Jesus, like, Jesus, like, John, you can do this. And so John baptized him. And, you know, John's probably already nervous. Can you imagine as John baptized him, the whole sky gets ripped apart? I don't know what it looks like to have the sky ripped apart, but I'm sure it would be an interesting sight to see the sky ripped apart. You know, I've seen those guys who work before, like phone books. That's in my mind kind of what it looked like, like God just rips it in half. And then we see the Holy Spirit comes to sin like a dove. So the Holy Spirit, all three of, of the Godhead are present here. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. The heavens have been torn open. And then we hear God say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And, you know, I've heard a lot of great voiceover actors, you know, Morgan Freeman, um, James Earl Jones. I don't think any of them have a voice on what they heard that day. I mean, you talk about a voice that you're not going to forget. That's going to be a voice that just resonates. And they say, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Why did Mark go through all this 
Why did he why did he give his own personal testimony? Why did he bring in the, the prophets? Why did he have John the Baptist? Why did God the Father and the Holy Spirit all show up to identify who Jesus is? Well, Jesus was a very special person. He was the Son of God. He was a hundred percent man. So standing in front of him, he didn't look like anything special. Jesus wasn't, Jesus looked just like you and I, just like a normal, typical human being. When it got hot, he sweat. When it got cold, he shivered. When it when he got hungry, he had to eat. He was a man, a human, just like you and I. There was something that was so much different about Jesus. He was God. And I'm so thankful that he is. Because just like John had said, there was somebody that was going to show up in that wilderness and lead them out. Not like anyone, not like Joshua did in the Old Testament. This was even going to be bigger and better than that. And you know what? I want to ask you guys this morning, this, or this evening, it's not morning. I used to speak in the morning, so sorry. But um, old habits I are. This evening is, we know who Mark thought Jesus was. We know who the prophet said Jesus was. We know who John the Baptist said that Jesus was. And we know who God and the Holy Spirit said that Jesus are. But who is he to you? Is he just some guy, you know, that you see on the back of a bumper sticker, like holding his hands out and wearing a robe and kind of has a halo sometimes? Is that who Jesus is? Is Jesus is something that we sing about in a song or we read about in our Bible? If that's all who Jesus is, friend, you've never been introduced to Jesus. Because Jesus is so much more than a word on a page or a verse of a song or a tagline on a bumper sticker. He is God. And he left heaven, the most beautiful place that's ever been, that we, we can't even begin to understand how beautiful it is, to come down and to be beaten to a pole, to be accused of things that you and I did, take our sin upon himself, and be nailed upon a cross, to be left for dead, to be, to be honestly given up on by his friends and family, put in a tomb. And then in the darkness of that tomb, as he laid there, I can imagine on the third day, that as Jesus laid in that dark tomb, before it was rolled away, and just in the darkness, in my mind, Jesus opened his eyes, and he smiled. Because you know why? He knew that he had beat something that you and I could never beat. He had done something that you and I could never do. And that's overcome those sins that have beset us. It's overcoming that death that we all will face. And Jesus beat that for me. He beat that for you. And I don't understand why our God would do that, but he did it. And so this evening I want to ask you, who is Jesus to you? Because Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. Yes, he is God. And yes, he is all-powerful. But, but Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And it's very easy to have a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to pay him any money. You don't have to have a certain level IQ. You don't have to have a certain job. You don't have to have the right last name. All you have to do is come and say, Jesus, I'm not you. I'm not God. And I acknowledge that. I acknowledge the fact that I'm not God. And I ask you to forgive me of the things that I've done that are wrong. And Jesus says, if you'll come to me and acknowledge who I am, and ask me to forgive you of the things that you have done, I will make you mine. Amen. And that is, that is the most beautiful thing in the world because none of us have a chance without that. And so I want to ask you, have you ever done that? I hope that you have. I know many of you guys have great testimonies of how God has, has taken you from where you were, and, and I think it's so great. I think it's so great. But maybe you know who Christ is, but are you introducing others around you? Are you making that introduction? I heard one guy say, it's not our job to get people to marry Jesus. It's just our job to set him up on a date. And you know what? All we have to do is introduce people to Jesus. Because he can seal the deal without our help. He's God. And so the thing I love about this passage is that, that Mark just paints this beautiful picture of who our Savior is and how powerful he is. And all these witnesses just confirm it. And so I just... I want to leave you with the thought is, who is Jesus to you? If he's not your Lord and Savior, 
I know that I would love to talk to you. I know Pastor Greg would love to talk to you. I know there's people here that would love to talk to you and tell you how you can know that. And also, if you know that, are you making that introduction to other people around you? Are you introducing people like Mark and John and the prophets did to who Jesus is? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this evening. Lord, I thank you for these, these men and women who could be doing a lot of other things tonight. But they chose to come here on a cold January night to study your word and to be around other believers. And I thank you for that. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in the midst of the people in this church. God, I pray that as we've opened your word and as we've read it and as we've, we've looked at it, there's no denying who you are, Jesus. And so, God, I pray that if there is someone here tonight that doesn't know you as their Savior, has never acknowledged who you are in their life and repented of their sins, God, I pray tonight that you would do that. God, I pray that maybe as we sit here and we think about these great introductions by these great men in the book of Mark, that we're motivated, maybe a little convicted, to introduce you to other people in our lives. To give you that same kind of introduction to those around us. God, I thank you. I thank you so much for what you did for me and what you did for everyone on this, on this world. God, I pray as we take this time, as we have invitation, Lord, as we invite people to make a change in their life, Lord, that we will not leave the same way that we came in. God, that we will do business with you Lord, whether it be right there in our seats or up here at the altar, God, I pray that you would move at this time. God, we, we just ask you to, to meet with us. In Jesus' name, amen. With nobody looking around, this is a time with you guys. I want each one of us to just take a moment and reflect on what we've seen in God's Word tonight. The Bible says that God's Word is like a mirror and it reveals to us who we are. So I want to ask you once again, who is Jesus to you? Do you have a relationship with him? Maybe you say, I don't know that I have a relationship with Jesus. Well, you know what? You can come to know Jesus tonight. You can know him before you leave this room. If you'd like to do that, you can raise your hand, you can make eye contact with me, and we can, we can talk to you. It's worth the conversation. I'll be fine. It is worth my time. It is worth past Ray's time to sit down and have a conversation with you about who Jesus is and how you can know him. So if that's something you're interested in, please, please let me know. Also, maybe tonight, you are just you know that you need to introduce more people to Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I hope if you're a believer, we all want to introduce Jesus to more people. But who do you want to introduce to? Who is that person right now in your mind that you know I need to tell them about Jesus? I need to introduce them to Jesus. All right, if you have that person in your mind, call their name out to God. And say, God, I need a witness to my neighbor, my cousin, my brother, my sister, my spouse, whatever it may be. I don't know who it is in your life. But whoever that is, just say, right now, just begin to cry out to God, help me to reach them. Help me to have an opportunity to introduce them to you. As, as uh, we, we have this invitation time, if God's dealing with your heart, would you simply just respond to it? Are we going to sing uh, number 307. Number 307. And if you'll stand. Yes, if you guys will stand and sing with us. If God's dealing with your heart, you'd like to pray with someone, you can come down and pray with me. I'd love to pray with you. Let's sing this evening. Just
be here tonight and sing with us. But more than anything else we want you to do what Jesus asked you to do. To believe in him, not that just that he existed, but to believe in him as Lord and Savior. That is, you trust him to be your Savior and you commit your life to try to live for him. Yes. You'll stumble, you'll fall, you'll make a lot of mistakes. But he stands ever ready as a as a brother. He wants you to join in with others to be a part of the, the kingdom of God. So as we sing, would you be willing to come forward? And would you be willing to, to meet with the Jason, did I get it right? Justice. Justice, I'm sorry. Justice. Forgive me. <laughs> Would you be able to come to sh share with him or me or Marie or anyone sitting here on the front row that would be happy to help you give your life to Christ. They'd be happy to help you make a little step further in the progress of serving him. So if you come as we sing, what, the third, fourth verse? Third. Third verse. Josh. Stand up there, okay. 
Hi, Josh. What's up, guys? Now, I'll tell you how I met this guy. He, I was a student <coughs> pastor for the last four years. You haven't seen him anymore. I was a student pastor for four years in uh, Toledo, Ohio, and uh, Josh started coming. Now, let me tell you a little side story about Josh coming to church. Josh started coming to church because he was dating our pastor's daughter, okay? <laughs> He's in trouble already. Yes, and so... Of course, like most young people do, eventually Josh and our pastor's daughter broke up. And I remember as a youth pastor thinking, I bet this kid's probably going to be gone. Like, I'm never going to see him again. You know, he dated the pastor's daughter, they broke up, I'll never see him again. But there's always those great times in life when you get proved wrong. And God had a hold of Josh's heart. And I got to watch God just grow Josh into a nice and great young man. He's now a student at Toledo uh, University, and he drives down every Thursday in a car that sometimes makes it all the way and sometimes makes it to Marion. But uh, he drives down, and uh, he is helping us in our church plan up in uh, Worthington uh, get our youth, youth ministry started. He feels God calling him to be a pastor. And so it's just exciting as, you know, I got to meet him as a 15-year-old and see God use him and grow him. See him come to know Jesus and grow in his faith. And, and so I'm very proud of Josh. I'm really glad he got to come with me this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Guess what my first question was? Would you like to start a fresh start in Toledo? <laughs> <laughs> but Jeff, I want you to introduce your friends. Talk loud. This is my brother in law, John. And uh, my brother, Jeff. Yeah. John Thank you. Glad you're with us. Well, I, why do we have fresh start? I mean, it's on the back side of that page you're given, you see several statements there. I believe we ought to help people to love Jesus, love Him, to love all of His creation. Especially people. While we're on that subject of creation, my son was driving with their dog. He said 25 miles an hour, but the dog jumped out the window and rubbed all the calluses off the end of the dog's feet. So the dog is bound up in cloth now from a doctor right now. In fact, the day he went back to get him get the bandages removed, hoping that dog would be able to walk again. They thought it broke the leg, but it's okay. But we ought to love people more than anything. To have all people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Oh, so there's another. We need to connect with the Lord. That is, He's sending us to all the world. So we need to be on His mission. Whether it be in Toledo or whether it be around the other side of the world. We have some three people to come to our home this week. And they wanted to buy a house from us, they said. I think they really wanted to sell one. But they wanted to know, why are we buying a house? And I said, well, we don't need any more, but we need one for people to work. There are people who need to work, and they need to be able to work in an environment where uh, they can do so legally. And that's how you can do it in an open house, a house that's, un that's unoccupied. So we need to connect with the Lord's work, do whatever, and I believe the Lord's led us into doing this. But more than that, we need to lead other people by example and by word. It's not enough to give an example. They need to know why you're doing what you're doing. And so hopefully we can help you to begin to effectively do that. When we do so, I believe we'll succeed. If Jesus came into the world to do one thing. He said to seek and to save that which was lost. We can be a lot about a lot of church business and get so bogged down that we're not doing the very thing that he came on this earth to do. Seek and to save that which is lost. One of these days, uh, I'm going to sing a song for you. I've talked a lot about it. Attended a church across the Church of God meeting one time. And they sang a song, Win the Lost at Any Cost. So I want to help you to do that if I can. And I pray that I won't get in your way, but will help you. Uh, 
So Josh, I, I'd like for you to pray about doing that. I, I felt that we need to have a fresh start church in every major city because there are congregations of people there that are rejected by churches for whatever reason. But we ought to, they shouldn't be the untouchables. We somehow should have people in touch with the Lord and with each other. But that having been said, I want you to know that we're working on uh, trying to get some, some more houses for you to work. It costs to do that. We've already spent better than $38,000 on the one you're working on now. I'm going to ask you to pray about us finding one that we can do. God just said, well, are you just, just to do a house? I said, we don't want to lose money. Because the more you make, the more you can help. And that's our intent. Uh, and I hope that you'll do the same, okay? I want to thank all of our guests for being here tonight. And uh, Judson, thank you for speaking to us tonight from the Gospel of Mark. That's been a, uh, a treasure book for me. By the way, we have one of our friends in Youngstown, and he's memorized the entire book of John, and he does it dramatically. Uh, hopefully one day he'll be here. His wife is a former pastor's wife, uh, daughter. And she sings classical music. I'm talking about she can sing for two hours. And that just floors me. It's her joy music in Cincinnati. She did essentially that. But when I heard her once. Let us help to win other people. So whomever you work with, let's do our best to be the best influence we can possibly be. And so, so thank you for being here tonight. If I can help you in any way, you have my phone number and everything we send out. Phone number, email address, and you can reach me. So you can have my physical address, email address. And Jeff now got us a, a website, and you'll be getting some of that soon. And uh, he shows us eating in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really fast. It? Yeah. Oh, he speeds it up so fast. You see, you see Marita. <laughs> well, there's some things that are fun in life, and, and he knows how to help us with that. Any word from anybody that needs to be shared tonight? Thank you for being with us. And I want to ask Elvinor, who comes here week after week and uh, supports this work, uh, along with our, this Candace? Kathy. Kathy, I get the two mixed up, all right. Kathy, thank you Kathy. She's working on a mailbox, and she forgot to take the mailbox with her last week. <laughs> you know where the mailbox is? Yeah, I do. All right. We're coming up with Valentine's Day, which is, if you were in elementary school like I was, you gave a Valentine to everybody. Remember those days? Well, I think the church ought to begin to do that. That is, we ought to commend people who are doing something that are next to us. Not just wait for the preacher to make some comment, but we can begin to commend the people for being a real friend. So, you'll have a mailbox to you. Scratch a note in without any postage and stick it in the mailbox and we'll deliver it for you. Any other word? Um, my nephew, Joshua, is uh, who is living up uh, in that state up north? He uh, um, he recently had to go back to jail because he, um, he's there for for uh, ninety days. And I just want everybody to pray for Joshua because his wife is uh, is uh, um, home by herself with the uh, with the two little girls. And I heard from Joshua's sister that Sonny has one on the way. So uh, that Joshua could end up going back to prison. We don't know. We just pray that uh, that whatever happens happens, and that Joshua, Joshua will be. Uh, his, his name is Joshua Miller. Okay, thank you. By the way, Marcus Jackson. Also, you remember him? He's now recovering from back surgery, and he's responsible for several people that are here tonight. Being a fresh dog. So when he was serving prison term, he recommended people come to Fresh Star here in Columbus. Anyone else? 
Let's close in prayer, okay? Dear Lord, we love you. Our heart breaks for those who for some reason have not come to know you, trust you, love you, and follow your will. Lord, I ask you to help us to encourage them to do so. Bless all of our efforts. Lord, I ask you to bless that church in, in Worthington. A new start. Lord, what a wonderful place to have to meet. And people all around them unreached. I pray, Lord, you'd help that church to reach them for your glory. I pray this in your name, for your sake. Amen.